He's a racist. Don't speak damn Ruben. Good morning. I do not have the slightest doubt that the most popular chit-chat over coffee, not only in downtown Vancouver, but throughout British Columbia, is perhaps a, a prurient subject, a touch salacious, but nevertheless, everyone's talking about it. Whose names are in Wendy King, there she is, the girl uh, convicted, pleaded guilty to keeping a common body house, Whose names are in Wendy um, King's little brown book? 800, we're told. Another 300 or so named in various transcripts of telephone calls. And we're not going to see, at least for the moment, whose names are in the little book. Now, I'm like everybody else. I want to know. Because Bruce Donald, the prosecutor, when he presented the case, said specifically that the type of names are from the highest level in our society and were touched by Wendy King's prostitute activity. Now, the judge has ruled that the notebooks will be sealed and the transcripts will be sealed to avoid causing embarrassment to people named in the books or identified on the wiretaps. And first of all, I want you to consider what the judge told reporters, Daryl Jones. I have ordered the clerk of the court to seal the document. Their very nature indicates that they should be treated with some discretion. Does not serve any useful purpose to make them public. And the judge claims that it is within his discretion to keep exhibits like this private. I respect Judge Jones' sense of decency and propriety and his desire to avoid innocent people, and there could be innocent people named in these books, any embarrassment of any kind. I am well aware of the fact that some of the names might well be bogus, false, or just plain wrong, naming the wrong people. But I'm still concerned about, and they could even cause an injustice to some people, but I'm still very concerned about the basic principle because justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. Now, because, not merely because the highest level in our society has been touched, do I object to this decision to seal the books. It is impossible for the public to assess properly the conduct of the trial, the implications of this kind of cooperation, if they don't know the names. One name has come to our attention pretty directly from this before. I don't plan to excoriate that man any further. But when Donald, the prosecutor, says, the highest level in our society, I begin to wonder, from what high level in our society do we have people who frequent body houses? Are they people in elected office? Are they people in appointed office? Are they people of considerable importance whose qualities for office we could judge better? Did we know that they were frequenters of a common body house? Just for this moment, we're absolutely stymied. Justice is not being seen to be done. Not for a moment would I quibble about the ability, the integrity of Judge Darrell Jones to deal with the matter properly in every which way, except in this one facet of it. Certainly I'll be accused of being prurient, salacious, inquisitive, sensation-minded by raising this point. But am I really? Were I presented as a reporter with a little brown book today and I don't have a copy nor have I seen a copy, I'd be in a terrible spot. 
I'd be faced with a number of ethical and good taste decisions. Which were the legitimate customers? Should all the names in the book be given, or only some of the names be given? But I suggest that this is a problem for the media and not for the judge. And I want to refer to you from the depths of my long experience in dealing with this kind of thing as a reporter to what happened some 20 odd years ago in a, a case involving a bordello which was strikingly similar. And when the trial was over and a guilty plea was entered, matter of fact, by Nick Masalem, who so unhappily died the other day, he was acting for the call girls, I went to see W.W. Edwards, J.P. I hope he's watching this morning, Bill. And I said, I want to see the nine exhibits, books of exhibit entered in this particular case. It was the Diana Frew case. He said, you can't see them. I said, please take me to the magistrate. And the magistrate was that fine and wonderful man, still alive and in good health, Oscar Orr. And I said to Oscar Orr as a reporter, may I see these books? I am a reporter on public duty. What's that effect? And he said, Mr. Webster, I can deny you the right to see these books until the time for appeal is over. But he said, you may see the books. Don't forget it was a different time then and a different climate. I was on radio at the time and I just wanted to know what was going on. I didn't plan to use the names, nor did I use the names. Don't forget, said Mr. R to me, your name may be in the book. I said, not my name. Oh, he said, anybody's name could be in the book as a protection uh, of those who wrote the book. He said, furthermore, he said, um, I would be very grateful, Mr. Webster, if you would not make it plain to every housewife in Vancouver that these are public documents. Because if so, he said, many women will be rushing down here to examine the books to see if their husbands frequented that particular operation of some 20 or 25 years ago. I saw the books. The books were not sealed. And uh, I do not really think, with all due respect to Darrell Jones, that in a trial like this, with its social implications which have already been felt in the highest level of our society, that properly authorized people who are not prurient, not salacious, but want to know what happened in our open courts should be denied the right to see these books. Matter of fact, I have a suggestion to make. I suggest to Clark Davy, the publisher of the Vancouver Sun, who's going to make his mark in this town as an enterprising newspaper, man, publisher, that he should take action to make quite sure, if he can, in court, that justice in this case is not only done, but is seen, including the little brown book and the tape transcripts, to be done in public. So all I've got to say about that, still can't tell you, nor probably would I tell you, any of the names in the book if it turns up in a brown paper bag on my desk later today. What else are we going to do this morning? I'm going to talk to my old antagonist, in some ways, the Rankin, Alderman Harry Rankin, treasurer of the Law Society of British Columbia, a man of perspicacity and well-known in every possible public field in British Columbia. And we're going to talk about that disaster called light rapid transit as it affects this beautiful crowded city of downtown Vancouver. Harry probably has a good, simple, straightforward solution to everything. But we'll test Harry Rankin and LRT and the present kerfuffle after this break. Harry Rankin, first time you've been on my television program. That's right. A little bit classier than the last time we appeared together, isn't it? A little classier, yes. Same old program, finally, though. What do you mean, same old program? Well, people make programs, not the environment they're in. You Are know? you suggesting that it's not me that does the program, that it's the presence of outspoken, charming people like you that gives me an audience? Exactly. You exactly. always were modest, weren't uh, yes, you? Yes, it's one of my faults. Down to business this morning, because this is a key day on... Urban transit and light rapid transit. Yes, it is. Harry, I'd like you to look at uh, a map that we've been seeing back and forward oh, in the last few months. Can we see up in the monitor somewhere, if I can see a monitor? Can't see a monitor. Roll the monitor. 
Yeah, I want the map. There it is. Now, that's supposed to be the route of the light rapid transit from Vancouver to New Westminster. Do you agree? Mm. Looks like it. Some, some, yes, it does. And it's supposed to extend up to Wally. I think this is the Volridge plan, is it not? Yes, it was to extend the route. And comes down again to, what do you call that, the Arbutus line? Yes, to uh, Marpole or and through to Richmond. Are we anywhere closer to that than we were 20 years ago? No, I would say that if the vote goes against us this morning, in the sense that we take over this phony fi financing formula, we're back about 20 years. In the past 20 like years, stretch. how much preparation has been made, you might say, for today's vote? 20 years of it? Well, yes, there's been plans and sketches and discussions and uh, all kinds of money spent. We know where the routes should be. We know how to do them. We know the costs to some extent. We know almost everything there is to know about the subject. As a matter of fact, if you studied everything as much as this, uh, we would uh, know everything about everything in the world. Now, what it's about this particular death. plan that's up today? Is it a good plan which will be properly passed by the GVRD and at last set us on the road to a good bus service with light rapid transit down the road? Well, first of all, the plan today is how to take over a decrepit bus system for one dollar, which is worth much less than one dollar, because we've got to, you know, we've got to re-equip all the buses, the trolley buses and the buses, because they're obsolete. It is the plan to unload onto the municipalities approximately one-third of the deficits that are each year around 65, 70 million dollars. Before the BC Hydro paid the deficits out of the money they made out of electricity, natural gas, etc. So the deficit come out of sort of general revenue of a crown corporation. The new uh, process puts one-third of that deficit right onto the municipalities by charging a gasoline tax of three cents, and these are rough figures, a surcharge on electricity, which will go from 25 cents up to about two and a quarter over the next five years. And finally, if those don't cover it, uh, then on to the property tax. You're telling me that today the only decision liable to be made is having accepted the social credit government's bill dumping the system on the lower mainland. Yes. The decision today merely is to pick up a financing formula to put on the backs of the people of the lower mainland a third of the deficit. That is basically what is being decided today. Well, and then if you analyze that, and you say to yourself, we're going to have to pay another $35 million a year or so, which will increase over the years, what incentive is there to go into a rapid transit system and have the same deficit finance the capital costs of building it and the operating deficits out of gas, electricity, and property tax? They're going to say, look, you think we're crazy? We've already got this new tax placed on us. Now you're going to put some more taxes on us. Is the bill for light rapid transit something separate and apart from taking over the transit system? Completely separate and apart. Who pays for the light rapid transit if it ever comes? We do by the same kind of formula. Provincial government part? Part by the provincial government, yes. But the problem is that you've got to, they are not going to give us any capital costs. They say that will be all rolled together in the operating costs. You go out and borrow the money. Let's say you have to borrow $500 million, which is a round figure. Maybe some people say $300 million, but I'm saying $500 million for the first stages of it. That's about a billion and a half over 30 years to pay it back at 10.5% interest. And we're not going to get it at 10.5% interest if the interest keeps going well, up at the present How time. should it be financed, Harry Rankin? It should be financed by the provincial government paying the whole of the capital costs. You mean the rest of B.C. should pay for some fancy bus system for the rich people down on the lower mainland? Well, are they rich people in the lower mainland first? And should the whole of B.C. pay for it? What happens to bridges, freeways, railroads, uh, boats to Vancouver Island, uh, the B.C. Rail, etc.? It's financed out of general revenues. You know, you and I, the truckers, don't use these roads for nothing. When you lay down a freeway, you don't go and borrow the money in Burnaby to put the freeway through Burnaby and have the Burnaby citizens pay for it, do you? That freeway is for the use of the people all over. You're saying that the BC Rail we know is bankrupt or close to it anyway. Well, but still the BC government is... BC Ferries is down 55, 60 million dollars. Yes. The highways cost hundreds of millions of but it dollars. it comes out of general revenue. Well, how come Vancouver and the Greater Vancouver Regional District and the people down here have been conned into accepting a one-third deficit for an essential transit system? Well, let me tell you this. Last night there were 20... De first time we ever opened it up to public, the public. There were 25 delegations representing hundreds and thousands of citizens, and they certainly weren't conned into it. 
The only people that I know that have been conned into it are the provincial appointees on the UTA, the Urban Transit Authority, which in fact are appointees of the, prov of the provincial government. Now they've been skillful enough to put on some of the mayors and aldermen from around British Columbia. And I guess they're so overcome with the importance of their job that they forgot who they're negotiating for. So I don't understand why they would, you know, place themselves in the position so of get, getting onto the UTA, the Urban Transit Authority, and then representing as mayors and aldermen of municipalities and loading this debt onto us. The committee howdy caddy. Uh, I hope so, but it's going to be a slow process because if, if they get that vote through today, we'll, they'll have committed Harry Carey and we have, uh, on, all the citizens are falling on the knives as well. Yeah, Harry Carey with a blunt knife. Yeah. Social credit passed an act, though, Herb. saying this is what will happen. Yes. Did they not? Yes. You will take the bus service for a dollar. Yes. Uh, you will pay for the deficits, and we're using the figure of one-third as an average over the five-year period. Yeah. yeah. You will pay for it forever. And you'll yes. pay for it with a three cent tax on gas. Yes. Um, two, sure. 25 cents to two and a quarter on your hydro bill a yes. month. Yes. And additional property taxes. Well, that's not going to cover it. it. No way, shape, or form. So about five years down the road, it, the rest of it, the rest of that deficit will be come from the property tax. Now, we've been assured that that's a long way off. I don't believe those assurances. The figures, that, without going into the general formulas, the figures put up by the GVRD, and the figures put up by our Mr. Leckie in the finance department are miles apart. In other words, he's saying we'll be at that property tax a lot sooner than you think. You're an official to tell you that's that right. about the figures given by the GVRD. That's, that's correct. So Volrich official on one hand tells him one thing and Volrich as the chairman of the UTA has to accept something else. Yes. Webster or doesn't have to accept it, but does accept it. Webster and Harry Rankin, Alderman, City of Vancouver, after this break. They are on the floors, I think. That's the trouble. They should be on. Yeah. Alderman Harry Rankin, we're talking about, uh, I was going to say we were talking about light rapid transit. No, we're not. Has anyone decided a route for light rapid transit? Oh, the routes, you know, the, the, the engineering part has been done well done and overdone. Has anyone That's not the problem. Has anyone decided the type of light rail rapid transit? Well, we've looked. They, they've all taken junkets to Europe and they've looked at every conceivable thing. Unless we invent something new in the next short while, we know what kind of light rapid transit should be there. The mechanical parts are simple. They're completed. They're, they're researched. They're overdone. What we're talking about now is dollars and cents. How do you do it? And the economics of it. Principally, you're talking about dollars and cents to take over the present, did you call it decrepit bus system? Yes, it's a very decrepit How bus. How decrepit is it? Well, you know, many of the trolley buses are years old. We've got to replace 250 trolley buses immediately. We've got to replace a lot of the other buses immediately. They're worn out. What do I cost? Right now, well, I don't know, 250 trolley buses times, say, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars. You know, I don't know the exact figures. You know, millions, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars. Millions. As a matter of fact, there's been an order in for months. The cabinet has been sitting on it. Obviously, they don't want to buy it before they turn it over to us. And actually, we're in desperate need of them now, the trolley buses. So you're telling me BC Hydro would probably have bought them some time ago? Oh, yes, they would have bought them years. Now the cabinet's saying, don't buy them, stick it to the shoulders of the taxpayers of the Lower Mainland. Or wherever else you're going to stick it, but it's going to be on the taxpayers of the Lower Mainland, yes. Listen, if I'm a trucker and uh, operating in Vancouver, are you telling me that my price for gas or diesel is going to be higher in the GVRD area than it's going to be at Chilliwack? Of course. Three cents higher a gallon. Higher than anywhere else in B.C.? Yes. Well. Obviously, what the truckers are going to do, if they can, is they're going to... And this trucker spoke to us last night. It never occurred to me, but he said we'll load up outside. A lot of them will load up outside, come in, do their business, and go out again and load up out there. So we are counting on a increase in gas consumption. Mm -hmm. You see, that's part of the financing arrangements. But is there any, any uh, sort of evidence? You see, we're going into smaller cars because we're forced into it. Gas prices are going up. This trucker places this. It may, well, supposing there's a decrease in the mm -hmm. consumption of gas for the, a variety of reasons, and that could happen. Well, I'm glad you're here this morning yeah. because I have been, you know, it gets so boring you lose interest in this whole business. Well, you lose interest in it except when you're a municipal 
member of council. But you know what I mean? Yes, yes, I know. What I mean, all of me. a sudden, I realized this morning that it's not just a question of a one-third financing for the deficit on the buses. Yes. For all of the taxpayers down here, it's raising the money to build this so-called light rapid transit. That's right. That's right. Raised by the municipalities. That's right. And once they get stuck into this new financing formula, you can imagine the members of the public all of a sudden having their light bills go up, having their gas bills go up, having to face down the line somewhere, they're not sure where yet, something coming onto their property tax. You can imagine how enthusiastic they're going to be with their aldermen saying, let's push for transit. Especially, you know, maybe the Vancouver people, New Westminster people, Richmond people. But the further out you go, they say, well, what's in it for us? Because mm -hmm. they're not going to get that rapid transit tomorrow. All right, now, you, you know? are you going to GVRD meeting this morning? Yes, I'm going to be there at 10 o'clock. And uh, do you have a vote? I have a vote, yes. Do you have a weighted vote? I have a weighted vote of do four you, votes. Do you have to vote in accordance with the wishes of your council? No, you do not have to vote in accordance with the wishes of your council. Uh, you have to vote as a member of the GVRD. Now, that is f facing some anomalies. Uh, for instance, in North Vancouver, the mayor ha was for this formula. His council has voted against the formula, Mayor Bell. My guess is that Mayor Bell will vote against the proposal, although he's in favor of what it. What about your council? My council, my guess is that four will vote for the formula, and I am going to vote against the formula. Uh, but your council is in favor of the formula. Uh, the council has not yet voted on it, and there was a discussion last time. That is, the council has not given direction to the five members yet, officially. I mean, we've had discussions. But in fact, what was asked was a, a, an adjournment so that we could hear delegations from the public. So you are, you're there for free after that delegation bit to vote any way you wish in it? Well, what I want is for a further adjournment and to listen to the public. We had 20 briefs last night. Incidentally, uh, it's rather, uh, you know, I, I'd like to point this out to the public. There were eight members of the GVRD, of about 23 members present, at a full GVRD meeting to hear the public. Eight members. The mayor sat for a while in the public, didn't come up with the meeting. It was a formal meeting. He sat and then left. I'm talking about Jack Volrich. Yes, and he's the chairman of the UTA. Mm -hmm. And when somebody says he's in the audience, he says, oh, I like to sit with the people sometimes. Well, everybody laughed a bit. But he's wearing, he's wearing three hats. And That's member right. of the public, chairman of the UTA, appointed by social credit in Victoria. Yes. And uh, leader of the Vancouver City Council. Yes. And incidentally, you see, the GVRD now with this present government, it used to be an elected body. I was elected by the, the, member, the people of Vancouver when I was, ran as an alderman. It's now an appointed body. The mayor appoints and council approves. So any democracy that it had as at one time it's is gone. gone. He, can, he can decide to kick me out at the end of the year and out I go. Practical political question though. You are a lawyer, you would say that you're seized with this legislation, you're stuck with it. Yes. The only way you could turn it back would be to get social credit to scrap the legislation. Well, that's true. Or you can say, look, we're not going to accept it. If you do anything, you force it on us. You know, Have you yet signed a deal with Victoria to accept it in any way? No, it's a le understanding. A letter the, of understanding. Yeah, and the understandings are so weak that I asked one of them, is industry and commercial property going to be taxed on a surcharge on their electricity? And they said, yes, no, I think so. That was three people I asked. Yes, no, I think so. And these are honest people trying to give, I, I, they weren't trying Let to fool me. Let me ask you that question again. This, the, this uh, possible taxing of property yes. for further deficits yes. is not clearly... It's not possible. It's going to happen. It, it, there are no possibilities involved. Not in just it. the three cents in gas, not just the hydro surcharge. That's right. There will be a tax increase. On property. And are you telling me you have not been able to get a firm answer as to whether it would apply only to residential or to residential, industrial and commercial? I have been told, assured by the mayor, that it applies to residential, commercial and industrial as far as the electrical surcharge. I talked to some other people who said, well, the... the uh, cabinet has not yet approved the electrical on commercial and industrial and all the charts that I've seen refer to to residential property but funnily enough don't refer to commercial or industrial. You are properly suspicious. I'm properly suspicious of anything that loads 
money out of general revenues on to the taxpayers who I'm elected Your to represent. Your basic case is, therefore, that uh, deficits on Lower Mainland regional transit, apart from rapid transport, should, like the ferries, the BC Rail, etc., 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 be paid for entirely out of general revenue of the province. That's correct. The second thing that I think is just as important is the mishmash of structures. You have the cabinet, who really is in charge of everything. You have their... Charlie McCarthy's, the UTA. Uh -huh. You have the Regional Trans Transit Authority. You have uh, re district authorities. You have a structure that I think Leckie describes as a bit of a nightmare. More civil servants. Well, it's, it's worse than that. It's a nightmare of, of intermixtures of organizations which can't be defined, which are not definable as yet. He places it as being a very difficult type of structure to work in. Okay. And civil servants always understate things because they know who they're working for. Hold on. I wanted to see if you can raise some telephone calls for me on yeah. this highly dull and complicated subject this yeah, morning. Well, it's not complicated, and it's not dull. Because well, most taxpayers are not well, we'll exactly, see. they don't feel we'll it's see. dull when Could it's... you hold your breath, please, sure. sir? Do All I have right. to call you, sir, now that you're treasurer of the <laughs> Law Society? No. Just treat me the same as you always have. <laughs> a perfect scion of the sky, and scion of the establishment. Alderman Harry Rankin of the city of Vancouver. On the phone, to you, if you call, after this break. <laughs> Um, just one question about the Law Society. You wouldn't mind, would Go you? Go ahead. What, it's open. Do lawyers who write a uh, successful prize-winning book about the drug trade and all the corruption, a uh, possible and legal profession in the courts, do they get nailed for advertising? No. They don't? No, no when you get to the level that you're writing a book, oh. you're above the... Bill, Bill Devil's okay. The, you're above the crass advertising. He's going to be the best known lawyer in BC for a while, but that's he, okay. He was very well known before he wrote his book. I see. No, and very competent. No citation for Willie. No? Just couldn't, that's for Mr. Devil's benefit, little joke. Go ahead to Harry Rankin. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Harry. Good morning. <laughs> Just a, a, figment of the, a figment of thing. I don't know whether you know about it or not. But we're talking about transit in this particular instance. Do you realize, okay, with all due respect to the Social Credit Government and also to BC Hydro Management, that they have in excess of 100 buses in storage. Now, the fact is, because when a bus gains 200,000 miles, it either has to be replaced or completely rebuilt. Now, Hydro has been taking those out of service and storing them. Where are they stored? I, well, it's something you should look into. because You're I would, telling me that 100 worn-out buses are stored on BC Hydro property in the Lower Mainland? Because the GVRD was taken over and the GVRD is going to be stumped with that expense. Are you a bus driver? Pardon me? Are you a bus driver? No, I'm not. Well, I'm associated with it. But uh, did, yeah. you, did you know that, Harry, no, if he's I, right? I didn't know that, but I guess he's right. Into, Harry, obviously, they're obviously. I've told you that they need 250 buses now. ...and the taxpayer is going to have to pay for it. Good, good point if you're right. Go ahead, please. Okay. Yes, uh, I understand that uh, Edmonton, with their light rapid transit, they uh, used property taxes, and there was only a slight increase in the uh, total property taxes throughout everyone. I believe that uh, they only spent something like $6.5 million on uh, their rapid transit system using existing rail right-of-ways in that. Uh, well, why can't that be applied instead of using uh, this taxes on uh, gas and uh, hydro? Hydro's high enough as it is. Well, first of all, you know, it's, it's always easy to generalize. We can't use our pre present trackage because it's not in the right place. Uh, we've got to u put the rapid transit in. We have a right-of-way, the old Central Park Line, which was rapid transit of 25 or 30 years ago. We have that right-of-way, and then we have the other right-of-way into Richmond. Now, land costs differ in different places. I don't know uh, what they're doing there in, in Edmonton. Uh, I have a general idea of the formula for uh, financing. 
But the fact is we couldn't use our trackage here for anything more than commuter trains to bring five or 6,000 people in. We must put the rapid transit in the corridors where the people are. So we're not talking about uh, uh, Edmonton's, which I think is a very, very low figure compared to what we've got to spend. Go ahead, please. Um, you just spoke of a transit corridor. Uh, that's fine if you live within the block of where it is, but how do you get from your home to the railway? Well, uh, rapid transit has station stops. And you, you still keep... got to get to the station. That's right. You use your bus service to get to the station stops. Right, live a uh, mile away. Well, that's right, but that's you, you, you tie your bus lines into your rapid transit. Why transit not brings with the buses then? Go for park and ride. Well, park and ride is fine, but have you ever... I was coming out the freeway or over the freeway to the station here. Have you ever seen the freeways at the present time? Yeah. They are jammed. Right. You know, we're not talking about cutting down the amount of traffic. We are talking about keeping the present level of tra traffic on the roads, which is dropping... The speed is dropping each year and getting the, ne the other batch of people onto rapid transit. So don't worry. If we get the rapid transit, you'll have a bus that will go close to your home as it does at present, and take you to those stations. Go ahead, please. That part's done. The technology is done. Go ahead, please. Uh, is that me? Yes. Uh, yes, one thing I don't understand is that we're paying income tax, and why is that money not used? Why is that money blown all over the countryside for all other purposes? Why is it not used in the first place for bridges, for transportation? Second point, I... Uh, have been in Hamburg myself, and I seen the transport system there. You can go from the bus onto the uh, railroad line, something like a railroad line. They can, uh, yes, yes. And uh, then back on the bus. You just pay for the distance you're going, which is comparable to 50 cents. Like going for 50 cents from here to Langley or uh, uh, back. Yeah. Well, let me deal with your first question, and your first question is a good one. The federal government has talked about energy conservation. Where is there a greater energy conservation to get people on rapid transit and out of cars? Number one. Number two, uh, there is precedent for the provincial for the federal government paying on rapid transit. They paid 50 million through winter works programs for the Toronto rapid transit. They paid for the Montreal transit because of the Expo. They have said that they're they're open to discussions on it. Now that doesn't mean a lot, but I would have thought that long before we got into this position, we would be negotiating with Ottawa and talking about that. The man's correct. We're collecting billions and billions of dollars, and somebody says, Take a, turn off your light when you go from your bedroom to your bathroom or to the living room. Turn off the light bulb. And if we all turn off our light bulbs, whatever dim bulbs that will do that, we'll have, save energy. If we put a rapid transit system in and move 20, 30, 40,000 people out of their cars into rapid transit, You'll save what a, energy. You'll save energy and you'll save, and, you know, you, what's happening? As the cars slow down from 12 miles an hour to 10 miles an hour to 8 miles an hour, the motor keeps running, the, ca the gas keeps burning. And so up goes the consumption. The man is absolutely correct. There's no way that the federal government should be left out of this financing formula. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Alderman Dalton Jones, Surrey. Uh, Harry? Yes. Yeah, congratulations. You laid it on just the way it is, and... Uh, I, your comments relative to uh, councils, or pardon me, the GBRD representatives from areas not necessarily giving the opinions of the council by majority uh, is one of great concern. Uh, in yes. Surrey, we uh, voted not to accept by majority, and uh, our representatives indicate that they will be voting for. Yeah. And uh, obviously, uh, it is a bad deal and uh, your comments relative to getting federal participation on financing. My understanding is practically every other one in Canada has been financed in that particular manner. Sure. And our people could get it too if they fought hard enough for it. But I want to deal with this question of representation. Right. Because you see, I may be accused of being in the other direction. There's five members from Vancouver. I used to be elected. As a matter of fact, I had 5,000 more votes than the mayor. I was elected with 50,000 votes. And uh, I am now not elected, I am appointed, and presumably the mayor can remove me. Not presumably, he can. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest if we're going to have a regional district that has any real representation, we're going to have to have a completely different structure. Because right now, we are in a position where, you, as you say, the council has 
s says one thing and the representative says something else. And that's not democracy as I understand Mind it. Mind you, you were lucky, Harry. If Vancouver Council had taken the vote and said they were going to vote for it, you would still have voted against it. Yes, I would have. Yes, I would have. Because I, I think I owe a higher loyalty than that. I owe a loyalty to the, what we're discussing. And I'm not going to vote. If I had to resign from the GVRD, I'm not going to vote for something that levels, that reduces us down to paying for rapid transit on the basis of these particular things. And that supersedes all the other things. Thanks, Alderman Jones. One more session with Harry Rankin after this break. If GVRD passes this formula today, we're all committed. Is that right? That's correct. We're you committed. want a delay. <clears throat> That's You're correct. going to ask today for another adjournment. Yes. You won't get it, will well, you? Well, I'm not so sure we won't get it. You see, uh, you know, people say, well, the government's got to have the no by the deadline. Well, 14 months ago there was a deadline, or 10 months ago there was a deadline. We said no dice. They all said no. They, they hung tough. We saved $65 million hanging tough. And the world hasn't come to an end. We're still running a bus system. In other words, they shaved the formula a little more to your favor. Uh, well, in a, one area and shaved a little up, off in the other area. We've from, got back as bad a formula as we started with. From Cranbrook, go ahead to Harry Rankin. Good morning, Jack. Good morning, Harry. Morning. Good morning. Uh, you're a pretty highly visible man in British Columbia, Mr. Rankin, and I've always thought that you have a pretty highly developed conscience. But I think on this matter, it's a pretty parochial conscience. I don't think that we living in Cranbrook should subsidize transportation in Vancouver. I don't think my tax dollars should be used that way. After all, that's taxation without representation. And uh, I heard you crying about three cents on a gallon of gas. If you paid 10 cents more, you wouldn't be paying what we pay out here. So I think you could stand p even five cents a gallon to pay for your transportation system, but you people pay for it. Well, let me put this to you at Cranbrook. I know Cranbrook quite well. I've done a few trials up around that country. Uh, the, you get a lot of money out of general revenues, the highways, the bridges, and all that in those smaller areas, and I have nothing against that. Uh, when you say it. parochial, half the people of British Columbia live in the lower mainland. Hardly parochial. You know, we represent half the population of British Columbia. Uh, that's not like representing, uh, you know, the village of Sumas or something. You know, it's really a little larger than that. But you and I have, a, a, have, I have a reasonably revenue, developed conscience. I, I don't mind you having, I know you pay high amounts for gas, and I know you pay too high amounts for gas, but I know also that we build large bridges, large highways, because we have to, and there's no, no argument. I don't want to have any fight with the people of British Columbia on this. I simply want to say this, that general revenues have always been the way that transportation has been paid. Our transportation is diff different than your transportation. I don't want to cut anything from your transportation. I want your transportation to be better, if possible. And you may have small bus systems in Cranbrook, and you may need them. And I'd want the same formulas to apply, because Cranbrook is going to require, in the city itself, a transportation system of a small sort. But look, we're not taking anything from you. You know, there's a, I, I mean, I don't want to go into the whole aspect of, of uh, financing in British Columbia. But in many areas, not just in transportation, the lower mainland is, is paying a heavy share of it. Everybody in, in, in British Columbia is being taxed. But uh, please, don't make it a sort of, you know, a parochial question. It's well, half exactly the population. Feel, Mr. Wright, it's half the population of BC we're talking about. And many other people out there feel the same way. I'm yes, quite sure. Yes, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Go ahead, please. I'm sure. Hello. Yes. Uh, would it be possible to have a sales tax in British Columbia, the same as Ontario, seven percent, and use that extra three percent to cover the costs of transit in all urban areas throughout the province instead of separating lower mainland? Well, it may be possible to do a number of things. For instance, it may be possible, you know, I noticed that Petrocan, or one of the big, not Petrocan, one of the big companies, made about uh, uh, a quarter of a billion dollars profit, up about 100%. It may be possible to tax some of the big industries, like, uh, you know, oil exploration and oil development. But how have we and, and it may be possible to tax some of the uh, profits of the automobile industry, it may be possible to do a lot of things, but it would seem to me, those are discussions, the worst area, the worst area is to lay it on the householder. And that's, that's what they're doing. And that's what they're doing. I, I, you know, I think that this man's got a point that that may be a little broader base, but when you lay it right on the householder, whether you've got a house in Cranbrook or a house in Vancouver, there's a lot of poor people in the lower mainland. 
living on fixed incomes, living on or unorganized, who take home seven or eight hundred dollars a month pay, and they've got to pay it. Yeah, That's the point. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Rankin. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could enlighten me on something. <clears throat> if it hasn't been familiar, just what kind of rapid transit was going to be put into effect in Vancouver? Uh, how come now for for two or three years there's been a double car uh, rapid transit vehicle stored at uh, the um, low Hayden boundary? I know they bought some piece of articulated equipment in Europe. I never can figure out. I never get further than Burnaby. They always give me a trip to <laughs> Burnaby. Jimmy Lottam, I bought that during the <laughs> NDP right, game. That's right. Days about 1974. Yeah, or I'm not something. sure if that's a rapid transit vehicle or an articulated streetcar or what it is. It's but something. It's something. Sure we is listen, weird looking for we, sure, but I often wonder about. Yeah. It. Well, it's one of those little foibles that ministers of municipalities have. You know, <laughs> when they got nothing else to do, they take a three-month <laughs> trip to find out what other people are doing. When they could write a letter and get all the brochures and, and stay at home and mind the, the, the till. You see how we are misleading people in a way, Harry? Yeah. The only rapid transit on the horizon at the moment is the transfer of a decrepit, your word, bus system from the BC Hydro, which doesn't want it, to the, the, the what, Transit the, Authority. The Urban Transit Authority. The Urban Transit Authority. Right. There is no mention yet of money financing a firm That's plans right. for light rail rapid transit. And let me make this point again to these people. Not only is there no money for it, but once you get stuck with this formula, the chances of people saying, let's get on with rapid transit, let's double the tax on our homes or on the gas or on the surcharge of electricity, they're going to say, go fly a kite. I'll get the old car out of mothballs or somehow or other, but I'm not going to go and tax myself still further. So I say we are putting it back 20 years, not, uh, not expanding it. Harry Rankin heads from here to the GVRD to cast his four weighted votes for, first of all, an adjournment for more public discussion. And then if he loses that adjournment, to vote against this, this dreadful formula. It's a dreadful formula. And Next I think question. everybody is going to be aware question. of that. When does the uh, Volrich uh, term expire? Uh, Van year. Vancouver Council has elections next November. Surely this time, Harry Rankin, you will finally gather up enough courage to run for mayor in the kind of swan song or the twilight of your political career. Well, I'm not really in the twilight of anything yet, Jack. Uh, I'm a young man. Do you deny you're in the twilight? <laughs> I deny I'm in the twilight. It's, it, or it's going to be a long twilight. I'm 59. You know, it's the, the salad years are ahead. My thanks to Harry Rankin. Next, Ted Leather. Ted Leather? Edwin Leather. Edwin Leather. Ted Leather. Sir, oh, a night, if you please. A KCMG, KC something or other. After this break. But if they were wrong. Everybody, well, almost everybody, it seems nowadays, writes books, writes thrillers. <laughs> Everybody, well, almost everybody, it seems nowadays, writes books, writes thrillers. But you could have knocked me down with, uh, I suppose, with a traditional feather, if you'd said that Ted Leather, formerly known as Sir Edwin Leather, a prominent member of the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom for many years, prominent British broadcaster, Canadian-born, was in the business of writing adventure stories about terrorists. Over at the farm at the weekend, I picked up this book called Mozart Score. Really quite exciting. I must okay. pay you a compliment. Uh, you what judge. shall I call you, Sir Edwin, Sir Ted, you or shall call I call you Ted? Shall I, I just call you sound Ted? Sound more natural? Doesn't seem quite right, does it? Well, it does to I me. Feel? Does to me. I'm, I used to be excellent, but I'm not anymore. What are you now? Just Ted Leather. Just Ted Leather. Oh, were you excellent? Trying to sell books. When were you excellent? Before you began I, to age. When I was the governor of Bermuda. I represented the queen. By golly, then I was on my dignity. You had to be, be respectful to me then, but not anymore. The governor and the commander-in-chief. Yeah. Of right. the crown colony of Bermuda. Not an interesting point, but it's not a crown colony. It's oh. a colony. Technically, in fact, Bermuda's been self-governing since 1685. Any British governor who ever dared to interfere with the affairs of Bermuda, they didn't rebel the way the Americans did. They just put him on a boat and sent him home again. 
1973 to 1977 after a distinguished career as a conservative politician. Thank you, sir. What took you to Britain in the first place? Because you still have that mid-Atlantic accent. Uh, well, the, the simple answer to that, of course, was the Canadian Army. I was at the RMC when the war started. And the we RMC. Were promptly Don't Royal forget, Military sir. College of Canada. Oh, here? Yeah. Oh, indeed. Yes, rather. Uh, in, in Kingston. And uh, the war came along, and suddenly we were told we were officers and soldiers. And the next thing I knew, I was in England. And then, of course, along with all the Canadian Army, we had a long period of inactivity where we weren't fighting anybody except uh, sheep and cattle and barmaids in Hampshire and Sussex and so on. And I got involved in politics then, and uh, the opportunity came. I jumped. While you were a Canadian soldier? Oh, yes, indeed. You took an interest in British politics at that time? Yeah, yeah. And finally ran for the House of Commons when? I ran first in 1945 and got well and truly beaten, which is the right way to start. You learn much more that way. Gives you a touch of humility. That is very important in politicians. You know, I was going to ask you if you ran for, if you were the MP for Leatherhead. That is just stupid, isn't it? There is an MP called... Yeah, well, Le Leatherhead, Le yes, but the, the funny thing about Leatherhead, of course, is it's where Max Beaverbrook lived for many, many years. That's why it came to mind, perhaps. Well, that could be. That's another story. Okay. Listen, we're gonna, we'll have to talk about your book. You Please, know. I want to talk yeah. about the book. Now, I've come got... to Vancouver to sell my books. Imagine a knight... KCMG, KCVOLLD, former governor and commander in Chief Bermuda, flogging a book like a simple, ordinary, common and garden huckster. Isn't that a beautiful thought? How did your first book go? It sold over 60,000 copies. And what was the name of selling. it? The Vienna Elephant. Didn't see that one. Well, the sales in Canada were not a happy story from my point of view. That's why I'm now with a different publisher. Uh, your second <laughs> book is the Mozart score, in which, yeah. rather intriguingly, you're mixing real people with facts. That's right. I'm quite bluntly trying to write faction. To me, the most exciting... Write what? Faction. As distinct from fiction. Exactly. The most exciting book I have read, uh, written in the post-war era, I think, was Freddie Forsyth's Day of the Jackal. Had uh, him on the other week. So I heard, yeah. Right, boy. I admire his technique. So that's what I've done, as you've seen in the Mozart score. Uh, of course, my character is fictional, but there could be somebody doing exactly what he's doing. The names of the police people and so on, the, the, the politicians, they're the real names. Karl Reidinger is the police president of Vienna. He's a great friend of mine. He's given me a great help and, and guidance. And if you check on the, the theme that is weaving through the story like this of the hijacking of the Lufthansa 737 from Mallorca ending up in Djibouti, the shooting up, You'll find every word, every name, every timing is accurate to the exact detail. And I've woven my story into the true facts. And of course, you're, you have your Israeli hero, the scientist fellow, yeah. the, with the man with a horrific invention. We don't have to give it all away. The horrific development in, mm -hmm. in the nuclear field. And that is all perfectly plausible. Again, I presented that. Nuclear uh, medicine is a fascinating subject. but. If it went wrong, if certain limitations, which most scientists believe are, are, are real and, and um, you know, unanswerable, but if they were wrong, mm -hmm. the kind of thing I suggest in this book that this man's working on could perfectly well happen. I studied with doctors and so on, to, so but I got the facts right. even as much, if not more than Forsyth, you bring the storyline into a very cold, chilly, disgusting, international intrigue of cold-blooded murder. Yes, don't indeed. you? Yes, indeed. You, but the only person you don't include, but you mention him, is Carlos. Oh, yes. And Carlos, of course, was, a, was a, one of the you know, most notorious terrorists. He comes into my story. And you obviously aren't very fond of the PFLP or the PLPF or whatever that is. No. Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Again, the same people. Habash is still there. Haddad it was the real. George Haddad. The real uh, Himmler of the peace, the torture and all this. He's dead. Arafat, by comparison with Haddad, really is a boy scout. Uh, to a degree, that is true, but it is terribly important to remember that contrary to so much uh, PLO propaganda, these people work for Arafat. He's got away with this in the United Nations. You mean the time terrorist organization again. that, in fact, under the overall suzerainty of Yasser Arafat? Unquestionably. No question at all. I wouldn't say under the overall control because no. they control themselves, but they're all part of the whole Palestinian Liberation Organization. Does it horrify you to think, uh, Ted Leather, 
that all of a sudden these people whom one might not regard as emotionally stable have mm -hmm. got access to all the money and all the resources oh, of the Qaddafis of the world today. It does indeed. Gaddafi from uh, Libya and everybody buys their oil uh, is the money bags and a great deal of the training and the technique uh, quite openly is done in Soviet Russia. Patrice Lumumba University in, in Moscow is You mentioned Patrice Lumumba University. I'd yes. forgotten about that. Oh, yes. And the Soviet don't talk much about it, do they? No, they don't, but uh, it's... Oh, yes, of course. Like money back? Sure. Money yeah. back guarantees? Yeah, right. Satisfaction? Ted Leather, former Tory MP, big noise of the Conservative Party in Britain, former governor of uh, Bermuda, Sir Edwin Leather, etc., 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 etc. But uh, if we were just having a quiet drink among ourselves, we can't put it beyond the resources of the CIA, MI6, MI5, or even our somewhat feeble security organization in this country, to have 007s who kill if they have to. I would concede as a matter of principle, that's probably true, uh, and I would only say this, that there's no good going <coughs> on talking about Queensbury rules if the other guy is using bombs. But in a democracy, you must keep your of uh, breach of the rules well out of the public sight. Uh, you must, and, and you, you must, must endeavor not to breach the rules if you possibly can, and I believe that is what happens. Which is why all the British spies arrested in recent years in Germany and whatever have always been businessmen. Uh, that's Quam. an interesting theory. It's a theme, funnily enough, I'm toying with for, for, for my next book. Oh, yeah, but I'm sure I'm, you and I could name families which were planted by the British in Germany after the First World War to be ready for the Second World War. Yeah, when you say planted, though, Jack, it, it really doesn't work like that. I think people give intelligence organizations credit the wrong way on. What happens is not that somebody in London says, look, um, you know, Webster, you and your family, you go there and we'll look after you. It nearly always happens the other way around. That somebody comes along and says, look, well, I'm living there and I, I don't like what's happening and contacts build up that way. And this is particularly true with the Russians. I don't qualify anything I've said about the menace and the viciousness of Soviet espionage and subversion, but it is quite wrong to think that they are brilliantly causing strikes and troubles and things like Northern Ireland. It happens the other way round. When you get a bad industrial situation, particularly in Britain, as mm. you well know from your many years there, the communists will come and start getting into the act and stirring it up. The communists did not start the Bader Meinhof gang in Germany. They did not start the Red Brigades in Italy. What they did do was once they were going, they infiltrated. They saw that they were supplied with the guns and the bombs and the secret devices, and they're still doing it. We were quite conscienceless, because oh, the object totally. of the exercise is to make our system collapse. Well, of course, and this is what the nice, lazy, easy-going Western worlds do not want to face. Well, actually. nowadays... The communists mean what they say. We find it so ridiculous that you people sound like, take it seriously. You, like, you sound like Solzhenitsyn. Uh, I have read Solzhenitsyn, and I believe that most of what he writes is perfectly true. Sir Edwin Leather, World War III is bound to happen. Oh, I hope and pray not. I don't think it's bound to happen. Honestly, I don't. I'm not so sure. But uh, if it does happen, I'm quite certain the basic reason will simply be the, the, the sloppiness, the lazy thinking of the Western world. But you we, see, don't, we don't want any trouble. Of course that's we, part of we the We just problem. want peace and quiet and holidays in the Caribbean. Yeah, of course, but Preferably you can't have it. You might just as well say, I want to go into the center of downtown Vancouver and I want to walk down the street. You may want to. It's a perfectly reasonable thing to want, but you're going to get knocked down by a bus and killed. And here we are right now being hijacked on a global scale by the OPEC nations. That's right. And yet, do, does right. the Western society have guts enough to pull in its belt, cut down the consumption, live on stockpiling and say, the heck with you, even for a month, have even we? Even for a month. You're quite right. We don't have the guts. You're, well, uh, yes, I don't want to get involved in any local political arguments. Oh, no, I'm, lack of I'm not... Courage, uh, lack of, of a reality to face up to the hard, cruel world is certainly the biggest problem. President Carter, I think, could tell us all a lot about how difficult the problem is. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that this much uh, abused and, and uh, laughed at president has tried to do are basically right. 
but his people won't support him, so he can't do them. Sad, isn't it? I think it's sad. I think it's a great pity. Change of topic. Fine. Tell me about Maggie Thatcher. I mean, you know her, you campaigned with her, and she oh, yeah. certainly comes across as rather a chilly cardigan, twin set, and pearls lady. Uh, does she? I don't know. I've known Margaret for nearly 30 years. We were candidates for Parliament together uh, and fought on platforms together, you know, against Knocked the, on doors the together. mob, yes, back in the 1940s. She is without question, leave aside whether she's male or female, she is very feminine, a lovely person. She's one of the ablest people I have ever known. She really has a computer brain, she has a photographic memory, tremendous courage and tremendous integrity. But whether anybody can govern Britain, whether anybody can govern Canada these days is an open question. At the moment it's quite clear nobody can govern the United States. Well, uh, this is a phase of I our thought I uh, I know that costs have gone through the sky in Britain. I know mm. what you pay. What would you pay for a room today in the in the Connaught, the Park Lane, or uh, even the Hilton? Oh, uh, the Connaught Park Lane. You certainly wouldn't get a the smallest room in the house for under perhaps one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty dollars a day. And that would be not too bad. Yeah. Yeah. This... And you could pay a lot more. Frightening. Do you find that the inflation in Britain is really just going through the roof? Oh, it has done. I mean, it has done. But yet, when you go way. over there, everybody seems to have lots of money for the pub. Sure, because everybody's, everybody's spending. And Ev this is one of the insidious things, and I think we've got to be terribly careful it doesn't happen in Canada. Because once savings becomes a mug's game, once the ordinary people are persuaded there's no sense in putting your money into a trust company or savings anymore, well, then what do you do? You go out and spend it. So spending, in fact, it becomes greater. You get this surge of apparent prosperity, but it's at the expense of putting aside the seed corn. Quote from Sir Edwin Leather. It is one of history's great ironies that capitalism goes on winning all the real battles that affect the lives of people and continues to lose the ideological battle. A correct right. quote? Absolutely correct quote, well, exactly what I said. And how it's can true. you sell free enterprise and the deal take the hindmost in today's Western societies where everyone is protected against themselves and can expect the state to look after them from the womb to the tomb? Well, we're getting into the realms of deep political philosophy. Obviously, um, an element of, of compassion, of gentleness, of welfare in our society is a good thing. But, you know, there's a vast area between cutthroat, 19th century, laissez-faire capitalism on the one hand, uh, and a totally welfare state on the other. And that area in which, I would say up to now, Canada and the United States, certainly West Germany, have been operating rather well. Now, personally, I believe that uh, we've gone a little too far leftish, and we will be much more prosperous in the sounder economies if we move a little bit back to the right. But I'm not advocating you know, going back to the 19th century. You were on, 20, on any questions in the BBC for a thousand years, weren't you? A little short, just a little short. A little short. 25. Finish the quote, name the man and finish the quote, which started off by saying, sex in love. Uh, I think, well, that is mine. No, don't tell me, because I'm going to remember. Uh, sex is, and love, in love, is a beautiful and a sacred thing. But sex, unlike justice, should not be seen to be done. That is why I refuse to write pornography, as I refuse to write needless bloodshed and violence in my books, because I think they're degrading. Very well said. Name of that book again? The Mozart Score, published by Macmillan's. Rush to the nearest store. By Sir Edwin Leather, if you please. KC Quick, MG, KCVOLLD. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you. Very nice good to be with you. You're off at 10 30, aren't you? Yeah. Great. Gets a bit boring, doesn't it? Depends on how big the boobs are of the guest, and that was the object of the exercise. <laughs> Don't forget, you're supposed to stand on guard for Canada each and every day, and a number of people are supposed to stand on guard for you, like, for instance, ombudsmen here, there, and everywhere, for the prisons, for the consumers, 
and your consumer affairs departments, whatnot. And then there's the Consumers Association of Canada, of which Gene Douglas is the vice president. What are you standing on guard about these days, Gene Douglas, to protect Ooh. we poor consumers? All manners of things. First of all, uh, it's Consumer Week in Canada, as you may know. No, I didn't know. Well, it is. It is this week. Yes. And uh, the BC branch of Consumers Association is going to have booths in a number of malls around the city and on the North Shore and in Richmond. And we will be giving people consumer information. Oh, and you mean to say that problems? I'm supposed to eat and drink and smoke and buy as much as I can this week because it's <laughs> Consumer Week, is that right? No. Not Can't at all. Can't you see I've been trying? Yeah, I was going to say you're a great example of that, if I may say so. Yes, With you all may. deference, yes. Yes, yes. And respect well, it's, and humility. It's the porridge that does it. That's right. But at any event, we are going to try to help people to buy wisely and Don't to give me the try. Conserve. You've been in business a long while. How much do you get in the way of federal funds? Very little. At oh. this uh, BC level, we get $1,300 a year. And what at the national that. level? Uh, about $300,000. Quite a difference. Which is only a fifth of our budget. What though. are you doing for us with our money? We are petitioning government to get change. We are trying to keep them on their toes to do their job that they're supposed to be doing already in the way of enforcement and that kind of thing. And we are taking the consumer cause to the government people. Haven't you just become another little bureaucracy? Because oh, all. after all, everything goes up and up mm -hmm. and up and up and up. Well, we've been pretty, pretty instrumental in having some of those things held back. Though. What's the biggest uh, rate of rise in what particular consumer commodity? I don't know that offhand. Food, uh, surely. Probably food. It's difficult to say. I think the uh, the oil industry is is very rapidly catching up at this moment. But certainly, food is one that that applies to all of us. And it's something none of us seem to be able to do without, uh, regardless of quantities. Um, we have been pressing this new government to implement the food strategy that's been promised to us in this country. We don't have a proper food strategy. What? You've lost me right away. Who promised you? Trudeau or Clark? Well, every government that we've had all along has promised it. But certainly it was in the, the throne speech with the Liberal government. And we have had an assurance. The Liberal government. Yes, and, but we've had a meeting with Alan Lawrence, the federal. Who's he? He's the new federal consumer and corporate affairs minister. Toronto In Lawrence. Ottawa, yes. And, uh, he, of course, he's also solicitor general, which means that his attention is somewhat divided. And we have been pressuring them to have a proper minister appointed just to the consumer affairs department. All right, you used the word food strategy. What is mm -hmm. a proper, quote, food strategy, unquote? Well, it would look at all aspects of the whole food system, where we would have more competition, we would have less control by marketing boards. The powers that marketing boards have right now, for example, are absolutely horrendous. And uh, I might say that uh, a newsworthy item has come up just in the past day or so, where uh, Murray McBride, who is a former Liberal MP from the Ottawa area, has just resigned as the chairman of the Canadian Egg Marketing Agency. Now that has to tell you something, when M his maybe, position is so intolerable. Might just tell me that they're going to replace him with the Tory from the Director of Patronage. I don't think so. I think he has resigned on principle. He said that it was unworkable, that he could not manage the agency in the proper way in the interest of consumers, and he has spoken out for consumers in this regard. So it's not a political thing, I'm quite certain of that. And when it is to the point where he has had to resign, I think that really tells us something, that the consumer interest is really at stake here. Gene, we've got a few minutes after this break for mm -hmm. some telephone calls on what's worrying consumers mm -hmm. most. And that's what yes. we'll get, short, sharp calls from our listeners right. to Gene Douglas, Vice President. You're stationed where, in Ottawa now? I'm working out of Ottawa, but I'm still living in Vancouver. You're a lobbyist. Yes, well, indeed. With the government. Yes. Not I... a bit of difference between the Liberals and the Tories, is there? Not so far. I not have to tell you to that. Be in this field well, either, is it? I'm not too optimistic. I have Gene to tell Douglas, you. Gene Douglas, after this break. <laughs> Consumers to Gene Douglas of the Consumers Association of Canada. Go ahead, please. 
Yes, uh, I was wondering why in uh, the statistics and so forth that organizations like uh, yours put out, why they, it's always uh, recent news on top of recent statistics, why you can't do a comparison on uh, items that would go back a little bit further and also you would compare one item with another so that the average person could get a little more intelligence from it rather than it went up point. 0.03% or it went up 0.60% or whatever percent. He's got a good point. Mm -hmm. We have that kind of information in our BC office, sir, if you'd like to give them a call there. Do you well, keep price comparisons? Price yes, we do. And so forth. It's, it's always at an office. Why don't you put this out in your, you know, in your publications that you put out to inform the public? Because I think if the public really knew what was going on, the public would have a tend to have a slightly different reaction or be a little more concerned than they are. I think they're being lulled mm -hmm. into apathy by these... Uh, uh, yeah, wasn't there a time when you people used to advocate a boycott of this and that? Not a specific boycott as yet, but we're certainly getting awfully close to the point where we're going to have to do that. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, please. Uh, hello. The two biggest costs for the average Canadian family are in housing and taxation. Does your consumer organization get involved in housing or taxation? <laughs> well, we certainly have been involved with housing. Uh, in taxation, I think we have approached it from a number of different angles. Certainly, we have dealt with Revenue Canada in many respects, and one of our successes has been with regard to registered retirement savings plans, which we have been able to have modified. And I think that was a very significant piece of work that we what did. What was that you were able, to, were able to do now? The plans are different now. You don't have to have it all rolled over into a lifetime annuity. There are a number of options that you can have. Thank which you. Go were ahead, not available please. Available before. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Jack and Jean. Uh, morning. Just, just before I ask Jean a question, I would like. Just before I ask Jean a question, I would like. Uh, you to put your telephone number on more often. I was just saying that myself this morning. Because uh, we have trouble getting in. Yeah, let's put the telephone number up more often, please. I'm uh, from Cornell, and I agree with, with what Jean is trying to do, uh, and I respect that. But I don't believe that the food costs are our worst energy cost. What? I believe. Oh, I didn't say energy. Well, energy takes in a wide field. Mm -hmm. No, what I was saying, sir, is that it doesn't matter what your income bracket, food is still something that's essential. And the, the problem increases with your income level that's in right. terms of, of how low your income level becomes. Uh, the people at the bottom of the scale are suffering much more percentage-wise than you and me. Mm, I'm afraid so. Anyway, we'll put up the number more often for you. Go ahead, please. Yes, Gene Douglas, congratulations on your remarks about agricultural marketing boards. Thank you. <laughs> into it uh, right up to our neck for many years. And I believe that in a free country where everybody needs food, you should have the God-given right to produce food. And believe me, they've knocked our farmers out of business like you wouldn't believe. You can't take away a man's right to produce and take away his marketing rights and call it a free country. You keep going on that track and you're going to do the biggest the biggest favor to this country anybody could ever do. Let's ask her a question. You. Do you advocate the removal of restrictive marketing boards? Absolutely not. No, they, you do, but mm -hmm. she doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. That's the minute. Let's get an answer. We're not saying that we want to have the marketing boards removed totally. We want to have orderly marketing, but we do not want to have them restricted in the way they are. What with tariff barriers preventing chickens coming in from the United States, which is the, the latest wrinkle that we're hearing about, by the way. That's the latest move afoot with our so-called free enterprise conservative government, which I don't understand at all. It seems to me a contradiction in terms for what they stand for. Gene, we do not have orderly marketing. That is the problem. We had order orderly marketing and orderly distribution when the farmers had the free right to be involved in that process. Well, it's totally disorderly now. Thank you very much, sir. But you and I both know that there isn't a government in this country, Conservative, Liberal, Social Credit, or NDP, who could dare to do away with the marketing boards without having great resentment mm -hmm. from the industry and from many big farmers. That's true. Who've got it That's tied true. up in the yes. corner, right? And small ones. It isn't just benefiting the big ones, you know. Thanks, Gene Douglas, the Consumers Association of Canada. This is Consumer Week in British Columbia. And Visit in Canada. We're talking about BC.
and visit one of their booths in one of the, the malls. I'll be back with Linda after this break. Seen the donut man. Have you seen the muffin man? Okay, we got 30 seconds to wrap, right? Jean's oh, makeup seconds. plan. 30 seconds exactly to wrap, Jack. 30. 30 seconds. Lloyd Axwell is coming out. Is he coming yeah. on the program? See the other MP from Winnipeg? The other liberal. I'd rather do Axwazi than so, 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 so called successor, perhaps, to Pierre. One minute coming back. One minute. So is Philip. Maybe we should have them together. He's a brother. What well, time am I Hi. going out on uh, the Friday? Hi, Larry. Week Friday. Pardon? Time am I One o'clock. I guess we're in Ottawa at 9 o'clock at night. That's the, not too bad. Well, that's the best timing for you because. Uh, Who am I going to have a drink with that night? I don't know. Lots right. of people. Maybe you can see real pal. You can speak as loud as Jackie. You won't, you won't have to work so hard, you see, because okay. we have to hear you all Okay, right. okay. All right, I'll try to speak up as much as I can. It's okay. a long way for him to hear you. Yeah. I'm almost sure this is Wednesday. It is Wednesday. Ipso facto, tomorrow's Thursday. Tomorrow you have Dr. Keith Simpson, At the last. interview you did with him, 40 years of murder. I've been promising this for a while. Bernard Spilsbury's successor. And for murder buffs, especially weird, gruesome English murders, you can't beat Keith Simpson, can Not you? Not at all. Sit down quietly and watch it tomorrow. Do it right off the top, I think, at 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>